could you please give him a very warm welcome? Thank you. Morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming today. Um, some of you, I think, I've seen in my lecture yesterday, so you would have sort of got a bit of an insight on what's happening today. Um, today's session is dealing with people who have had a lumbar disc prolapse or are currently got one. Okay, so your patients that or clients that you've had that you, that you know they've had a disc problem, they're a little bit weak, you're a bit nervous about what you should do, this is going to be a great session for you. Also, people that are going through or basically are going through a current disc prolapse or someone that I'm treating that we're putting through the stages, giving you an insight on what we do and what's important about that injury. Because otherwise, when you get them down the track, if you're not doing the right things, it's going to get start getting unstuck. So there's a lot of do's and don'ts. There's a lot of uh, trying to dispel a few myths, um, especially about when you're squatting and when you're doing inner core work. Now today, I really want you to understand that today's session on when we go through our core and our breathing and our pelvic floor and all that sort of thing is with people who are dealing with pain. So not normal Joe Blow running around lifting kettlebells. It's people in pain. And it's also people who have got a very much a what we call an inner core shutdown. So where those muscles are not working properly and they've got a global compensation, we don't try and get you doing exercises that go back, sort of unpeel the layers and go back to the basics to get things working, to get them back to that normal level where they can do whatever type of core stuff they want. Okay, so just thought I'd put that out there to start with. So, first thing. Um, with these sort of problems, it is, done to this stuff is very complex, it's very difficult. It's not your job to, for you guys to treat it. It's your job to understand what goes on with these patients, what happens through physio. So when you get down the track and you're doing normal exercise with them or you're helping them with the physio, you understand it. But if you don't understand it, you're going to really struggle with what exercise to do when. Um, I'll go through your anatomy again, refresh what happens with the disc prolapse, okay, and why. Um, talking about this muscle compensation where you're inner core muscles shut down due to pain and injury and the body replaces it with outer core compensation and they get stuck in that pattern. We'll talk about that. Um, we'll go through our rehab principles, so what we are aiming to achieve with these people with disc problems, why we're doing certain things, why we're doing certain exercises, what to avoid forever with these sort of people uh, and what sort of things you need to be doing on a regular basis to maintain these people's health. Um, and give you an idea on recovery time frames because it is a lot longer than what you probably think. Um, especially when, when this problem is a, you know, disc problems are degenerative in nature, so they don't sort of go away, they get managed. Um, can I just uh, get a, um, I might just um, start that now. Has anyone in this class had a disc prolapse or a disc bulge? <laughs> no wonder you're here. You want some answers, don't you? Okay, that's pretty huge, right? That's, that's massive. How many people do you think in the class is about 160, 180? And about a third of that class put their hands up, so that's what, one in three? And that's, that's a massive amount. How many of your clients have had a disc problem? And that's just about all of you. Okay. Right, I'll have to perform for you today. All right, let's start off. Best thing to start off, let's get my clicker going, is anatomy. Now, I've got a nice little video that some of you might have seen yesterday. We'll come to that in a minute. You've got to think about this disc as a big car tire with a big juicy fruit tube in the middle. All right? So you can jump up and down on it, and it bounces and moves and bulges. That's what it's for. It's a shock loader. Okay? And as you move side to side, it'll bulge forward and back. It'll bulge. It's pretty resilient. However, it's a degenerative structure just like the brain. Okay, so just like knee cartilage, over time it starts breaking down. It's a natural process. Okay, so every one of you sitting down today that's above 30 has got some sort of degeneration in one of your disc levels, but you don't feel it. It's a natural process. You're getting older. Okay, um, the things you've got to be thinking about is this ligament here, see that one there? is your posterior longitudinal ligament. Now that's a massive, massive thick ligament that runs down the back of the disc 
in front of the spinal cord. It's designed so when you bend forward and do that, and the disc bulges a little bit, it doesn't bulge out and touch the spinal cord. So there's a big holding sort of reinforcement rod designed so your disc doesn't smash straight into your spinal cord. Okay? The thing about that is, it's not on the sides. See how it's just down the middle? It's not on the sides. So you don't have ligaments that wrap around the back of the disc because at every level, a nerve root has to exit to go down your leg or you know, into your buttock. Um, so when people have disc bulges, they're mostly what we call posterolateral. So they'll go out the back side where there's no ligament holding them. If you, there are various rare cases where, if, and we'll talk about quarter or quite in a minute, if, it, if that ligament gets fatigued and gets a bit loose and lots of wear and tear and it bulges out the back, that's when you'll start hitting the spinal cord and they start getting quarter or quina problems. We'll talk about that in a minute. That's more of an emergency issue. But you can see here, um, if you're getting a disc bulge, what's going to affect nerve roots and things like that. Um, these discs have a hydration mechanism, so they basically fill up with fluid and, and decrease in fluid over, during the course of the day. When you get older and those discs degenerate, you lose that nucleus fluid. So on a scan, and I'll show you in, a, in the next couple of slides, you'll see that there's less white, nice-like fluid that is a bit dull and a bit dry. And that's what happens as you get older. Other things to think about, muscles, okay, oopsie. Muscles around the spine, most important we're going to talk about is multifidus, which is a stabiliser and extensor. Okay, it's designed to, for stability, and it's a tonic muscle. It's designed to be there for a long period of time, switching on, holding you, not big, fast movements. And that works in conjunction with your transversus. So the two work together to try and produce some sort of like airbag tightness around that spine to keep it stable. Um, the other thing to remember too is when you look at a spine, when you get your spine model out, and you'll see those three curves, your cervical lordosis, your thoracic kyphosis, your lumbar lordosis, you see that nice little curve like that. That curve is designed so when you're in that curve, every disc pressure nucleus is even all the way through. Okay, So we can jump up and down. It's like a concertina. If our spine was dead straight, it would snap in half. So it's designed to be in a curve like that. What you guys have got to remember when you're doing, pe watching people squatting and things like that, is you try not to mimic what you see in the back with the curve in the spine, because the curve in the spine is inside my body. Okay? So if I try and make a really big curve there, to try and, oh yeah, I remember that spine, I'll get a curve there, you're actually hyperextending. Because the back of that, in your back you've got the curve, but then it's filled up with muscle. So there is some curve there, but it's probably not as much as you think. And I think the biggest misconception is people try and really get a, a good, oh yeah, you've got to keep your neutral and get a good, you know, good lumbar curve there. But you've actually probably come, got to come back a little bit into, so you've just got a slight bit of a curve. We'll show you with um, Michelle later on. All right, what happens? So, when a disc deforms and, and protrudes out the back, what happens is the wall pressure increases. So, Imagine something is pushing up against the back wall. Now, if you keep doing that for a long period of time, the ligament starts breaking down. It's a lot of stress loading. It's like stretching a ligament out. Okay? And it starts breaking down. It gets a little bit weaker. So every time they bend forward, it, it, it tends to start, oh, I'm going to start moving now. Now, what can happen is the, the nucleus here starts shifting posteriorly. So it ends up bulking forward. And some of these people, you know, they can bend forward okay, and they're going, oh, God, that's stiff. Because they physically, they've got so much pressure built up, they just can't get backwards. So you'll be quite surprised if you get them doing a lot of extension, all of a sudden they start moving it over the course of a few days, and hey, look at me, I'm quite good now. And that's one of the big alarm bells. If someone can't bend backwards very well, they've most likely got a very high disc pressure at the back wall, which is going to cause problems. So you get a ligament, ligamentous strain. These ligaments at the back here start getting fatigued. Inside that car tire, the tread starts cracking and fissuring like an old perishing tire. And then the tube in the middle starts wanting to migrate into the back wall. If it happens, it, that's when you get a disc bulge. And the first people get a disc bulge, a very acute, sharp pain, bang. It's usually if they're brushing their teeth or they're bending over, tying their shoelaces. It's not usually in the, in the gym, but it's, the, it's, it's what happens during the course of the day that leads to that. Um, 
you get, if the first, sometimes most, most people get a bulge first. It's the first bit of pain. That bulge then stays there for a long period of time, fatigues the thing, starts fishing more, and you end up, after that, tearing the annulus wall, and then you get a herniation. So there's a disc bulge, which is the weakening, and it bulges out a little bit, which will cause low-grade level pain. The herniation is the really big bang, pain down the leg, sciatica, numbness, pins and needles, all that sort of thing. Because as that wall it sort of explodes, if you like, that fluid will migrate out into the, into the area where it shouldn't be, press on nerves, cause a hell of a lot of chemical pain, which lasts for a long period of time. Um, and eventually that nerve root will get compressed. When you compress the nerve root, it's like putting your foot on a hose, the flow drops down. Okay, so pain straight away when you put, you put pressure on it. If you keep pressure on it, you'll start losing signal going down the nerve root. So the first bit of, in the nerve root, the, the, the sensation fibers on the outside, so they get hit first. So they get started getting numbness, pins and needles down their feet. And if the compression's even more, what will happen is they'll get, start getting motor loss. They start losing actual signals of muscle firing going down the nerve. And they, you know, they start getting foot drop and all sorts of things. Okay, so hopefully you don't get to that stage. But that's the process. To give you a bit of a visual, I've got a little video here that some of you have seen. And this is great. If you go to, um, you want to see this again, go to YouTube and type in disc decompression. And uh, this is actually a surgery slide, so I'm only going to show you the first part. And we'll just turn that off there. So, this will just explain a little bit about what I was talking about. Um, come on. So, bending forward, okay, if you think about where that, if I'm a neutral here, if I bend forward a lot, picking up the gardening pot, okay, I'm going to start pushing movement posteriorly to the back wall. There's your disc here, okay, there's your car tyre, there's your tube. If you look at it side on, okay, if we jump up and down, it's designed to be a shock loader, because what it's there for. But if you do too much pressure forward, what happens is this wall can start weakening and bulges out. Okay, there's your disc bulge, that'll hurt. Um, a lot of time people have got those, but they're asymptomatic, they don't hurt. Which is, you know, you're going to scan some of you will have that, and it doesn't hurt. If the wall weakens, there's your posterior lateral, see how the ligament's holding it there, it comes out the side. There's your big nerve root coming down your leg. Um, and if, what they haven't got here is a herniation, so this is just a disc bulge. But if that breaks, that point there, this stuff here will go into this area. And that's where they usually have a disectomy or um, take some of that disc out. On this slide, when you see it, if you download it, they actually put a rod in and, I think it comes in here, and they actually inject uh, a a needle and take out some of the fluid to drop the pressure down so that bulge reduces. This is what they're doing now. Um, other people get them to replace that sort of thing, but we'll come to that in a minute. So yeah, check that one out if you want to sort of use that as a reference. Okay. Does that make sense so far? We're good? Okay. I remind you again, it is a natural process. It's almost one of those things, you can't stop it, you know? but you can try and avoid how bad these things get. The most common cause um, is family. We'll come to that in a second. But when they do studies, they have no idea. We just worked out it's probably one in three here, right? Okay, it's probably more like two and three. By the time we'll have another 20 years on us, it might be three and three. Um, but no one knows because when they do studies, they'll, do, they'll always take a control group and they'll take a um, you know, blind group. And when they compare the two, the people who are healthy, in this latest study, 35% of those people had significant disc bulges with no symptoms. So they're going, well, you know, how does this work? Um, so we really have no idea. What they do show, though, um, in those studies is when they test people with disc bulges, they go, okay, we think you've got a disc bulge, you've got the right symptoms, you've got the pain, you're in our control class. 90% of the bulges that occur in those people are at L4, L5, and L5S1. Okay, so the lower discs. 90% of the problem is going to happen at that point. So if you've got a disc bulge, most likely it is going to be happening at that point. Um, the other interesting fact with this thing is when people get tested, people that are over 50 years of age, 
90% of their lumbar discs have got significant degeneration. So they might have pain at one, but all of them are going, because it's a natural process. As you get older, things get worse. But you may only have pain at one level. Um, and you know, disc degeneration can happen at, um, in the absence of back pain. So right now, we all might have some disc problems that you don't know about. But in 10 years' time, and you lift that lawnmower into the back of the car, then it goes. So it is a very good idea to start working on preventative stuff, and that's one of the big take-home messages today, is get your clients working on preventative work, because if the, your clients are the people that are sitting down, they're doing a lot of bending forward in the garden, you're getting them doing some weights, there's a lot of things that can lead to the problem. If they're not doing anything to help prevent this disc pressure issue and their strengthening issue, then they're more likely to have a disc problem. Okay? So family history is the highest course. If your mum and your dad have had disc problems, you're going to get one, most likely. It's a bit of a bummer, but that's the way it is. Um, so if you've got a client with a family cause, now this is a massive thing you've got to be doing. When you screen your clients the first time, you take down that medical history, have you had a disc bulge? Has your parents had a disc bulge? Okay? If you say yes, then you go, right, let's get these things and we've got to not do this, we've got to start doing this, and we've got to get you doing these stretches and make sure your core is good, that sort of thing. Otherwise, you know, you're more likely to get some of this. And you don't, trust me, with those people in the class who've had this problem, you know how bad it is, you don't want your clients going through that. Um, things to think about, I know this is a big list and you're going, oh my God, look at these things. Um, of course, sedentary lifestyle, because they're not very fit. Okay, they sit down a lot is the most Important thing, people who are sedentary sit down. They sit down poorly, you know, this sort of thing. Inflection, okay. Um, repeated flexion, so laborers, okay, tilers, people who are bending down a lot, right? People who are picking things up a lot, gardeners. All these people are doing all this sort of work without thinking about it, okay? They're not using their core very well, right? And the other thing they're not doing is probably not going that way. Um, the clever builders are doing this. You know. Every sort of half hour they're going, oh yeah, yeah, doing this sort of thing to try and reverse what's going on bending forward. Heavy lifting is a big cause. Repetitive reaching, people in Subway, you know, bacon, tomato, you know, cheese, doing this all the time. You, ever, you try doing that all day, that's going to start giving you a lot of problems because you're bending forward. And you'll see on the graph how much pressure that increases. Um, twisting, lifting from the floor. This, this lady here in the pot comes forward and then bang, twists. Here where they rotate through there. I mean, rotating is fine, you know, doing this sort of stuff is great, but not in flex, full flexion and trying to do it. Okay, or lifting something from the floor and lifting it up onto the workbench. That sort of thing. Okay, even if you've got a strong core working on, it's the movement, it's the pressure loading through the disc. Repeating, 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 repeating is the issue. Just quickly, yep. If the weight's heavy, no. But if it's a lightweight, if it's, if it's you know, if it's a, if it's a shopping, you know, if it's a shopping baskets, if it's if it's laundry, that's all right. But you shouldn't be doing laundry like this. You should be you know, doing a deadlift and doing it. Yep. Okay. Fractures. So people who have got a fracture, like cricketers, that sort of thing, where they have start getting pass fractures when they're doing too much bowling. They start if you've got a pass fracture and they get a spondylolisthesis with the the vertebrae shifts forward, it's going to create increased disc pressure on that level below. So people who have previous fractures, you've got to watch out for. Um, contact sports, this thing happens. Driving vibration is one of the biggest causes as well. People in, um, who are truck drivers, that's the thing, jumping around like this. Okay, very fine, high intensity vibration. Remember this is a shock loader, so imagine jumping up and down like that for a very long period of time, sitting in poor flexion all day, going home, sitting in flexion. Yep. These people are very high risk of getting disc problems. Smoking is, is a high risk, it's a classic, because they don't heal um, properly. Full term pregnancy for those mothers in the room, you are more likely to get this because of your anterior tilt shift you have over time. Your lack of abdominal control, lack of pelvic floor control over time, that doesn't get um, strengthened up for a long period of time to get them back into neutral, um, more likely. Um, Overweight and interesting, the last one, tall stature. We get a lot of people in our clinic, you know, six foot six with disc problems. You know, they come in 
and they're big and strong and like, God, you know, they're a bloody giant. But it's just because they're so tall, they bend forward so much. Okay. Right. Here's your chart. There's a reference for this in the back of your references, Narkinson. Uh, this is a very classic thing. I've actually color coded it to give you a bit of a visual. Right. This is what you've got to realize. When you are standing, like me, in neutral, you have 100% disc pressure. That's normal. That's what body's built for. When you lie down on your back, it drops to 25. This is why we get people who come in our clinic with a disc problem straight on their back. Bang, it drops the disc pressure down by 25 to 25%. Okay, they go, oh, that's so much better. Lying on your side, 75. Now, when you're brushing your teeth, 150. So I come forward here on the sink. Feels fine, right? It is 150% disc pressure. But the body's used to that. Okay? But with someone who's got a, had a disc problem, these are the sort of things they don't want really to be doing all the time, repetitive work. You know, working in, in, a, in a position like working like this is going to be no good for them. Okay? But this is why brushing your teeth, they go, oh, it's gone, you know? Because it's built up to that point at one more brushing your teeth, and, and there you go. Interesting enough, deadlift, 220. Obviously, if you increase the weight, you're going to have to be stronger to be able to handle that. Otherwise, the pressure will increase. This one here, sitting down, 140. People, you're sitting down now, 140% compared to me sitting 100%. This is why people who sit over a long period of time get disc bulges. Bending forward, tying your shoelaces. And this one here, what, what's this position? What do people do in the gym doing this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Picking weights off the ground. Yep. So you're going to do some dumbbell, you're going to do some chest press, and you go, bang, there it is. Okay, it happens all the time, right? What you don't want to be doing is rear delt flies like this. That's a shocker. But it's the picking the weights off. Bang, into there. That position there. Okay, 275. Someone who's got a dehydrated disc or previous disc problems, you've got to be very careful what you're doing with those people. Give them the weight might be a better thing to do. Yes. But you also you might be, when you uh, have been standing all day, you might have a lot of fatigue too. If, you're, if you've got a previous disc bulge and you've got a stand all day, your multifidus and tear is probably not red hot, and so you rely on your extensors to hold you all day, and that's the fatigue. So when you go down, they go, ah, ah and start cramping up. That's where you'd probably have to do different things and stretch them out. So that's not the pressure that you're doing? No, it's probably more fatigue. Yep, it's a muscular fatigue. So this one here, what's this one here? Crunchies. No more crunchies ever again for those people. Planks instead. Yep. This one here, what's this? For that flutter? You know, this one? No good. This one here, leg throwdowns. Okay, so 150. Things you've got to be aware of, you see people doing this, that's fine. They got a disc bulge, not so good. Yep. Okay. Great one to sort of, even if you, know, you want to tell your clients about what you should be doing. Um, great one to give to bring out and show them. All right, so someone comes to the clinic, what's going to happen? Pain and spasm, obviously, this will be very familiar to a lot of you people. Pain and spasm, like significant, like full on, oh my God, you know, this is really bad. A little bit of a strain, just strain, a muscle strain is not going to sort of pop them forward and they sort of can't move and they have to lie down. It's most likely a disc bulge. They're going to lose a lot of range of movement. So people who come in to see me, they'll go, okay, bend forward and they're going, they don't want to go any further than that. Can they go backwards? Oh, no, it can't go backwards. You know, nine times out of ten, that's a disc bulge. We can just diagnose that straight off the bat. Um, so when the, they might come in and they're a little bit shifted forward because you imagine like the bulge is out the back so they can't come backwards or they're like this. They're coming in, you know, pain on one side here and they're sort of going, I can't, <laughs> can't move. Has anyone had a lateral shift like that? Yep, very familiar. Um, so that's the sort of position they'll come in. They may have radicular pain. So if the bulge is big enough that it's hit the sciatic nerve, okay, it'll shoot down the leg. Depending on what level, it'll depend on which dermatome it's going to go down. Most likely it's going to go down the back of the leg. If it goes below the knee, 
that's more of a massive bulge. Okay? If it's above the knee, it's usually recoverable. Um, they say, or the surgeons say, if it's below the knee, you've got pins and needles and you've got a lateral shift, nine times out of ten, you're going to have surgery for it. It's almost irrecoverable to try and get that person with conservative treatment back to normal. So you get neural changes. If you've got clients that are you know, getting pins and needles in their foot after they've been sitting for a period of time, uh, they're getting shooting pain down their leg, they're getting motor loss, they're getting nerve sensation loss, the skin feels funny on their feet, that sort of thing it means they've got nerve root compression. Um, big thing for you guys, and that's what we see, is you've got to remember these guys have what they call inner core shutdown. So you get a mass amounts of pain wrapping around through the spine. Just like with knee surgery like I had, or any of you guys have had knee pain or knee surgery, the VMO disappears. Okay, you just lose that muscle there, and it takes six months to rebuild it. Same with your lumbar spine. So those multivitis and your TA want to shut down and not do anything. You have to keep moving. So your brain is not clever. We've got pretty clever brains, but they're not clever enough to switch them back on because they've got pain messages firing off saying, don't do it. So they compensate. The brain goes, let's use rectus and obliques. Let's lock these down. Let's use our lumbar extensors that are on top of your multivitis to do all the work. And so they start getting overworked. So you get a global compensation pattern happening. That pattern stays with you for life unless you re-educate the body to get that multivitis firing, to get your TA and your pelvic floor working together. Okay, and that's one of the biggest things that, you know, that's inner core versus outer core. Your outer core will be only do so good. They'll get you squatting good and everything will be looking great, and then they'll bend forward and brush their teeth when they don't need their outer core, they haven't got any inner core, and that's where they start getting problems again. Um, so your hip stabilizer is the other thing that will switch off. If your core switches off, most likely if you've got pain shooting down one side, okay, you're going to lose a bit of control here and they start getting other problems where they, their glutes start switching off and then they lose a bit of stability on one side. All right? Sound familiar? Yeah? Oh. Okay. Here we are. Here's, here's your disbulges. So there's a yummy nice one. Nice. See how high that is? Nice big fat hole. See this one? There's your L4-5. And there's your L5-S1. Can you see how this bulge here is a bit bigger than this one? See there's no bulge there? And this is bulging out here in that spinal cord. And this is, see how it's moved into the... So this one's sort of more of a bulge. This one's moved into the canal a little bit more. And it's all dark. Yeah, loss of that hydration. Okay, dry, yucky, de degenerated disc. So there's your CT. Um, First thing they'll usually go for with scans is, you know, if someone's got a lot of pain, they have to clear a fracture first. So you go for an X-ray. Then they'll probably go for a CT or an MRI. Um, a lot of the time, they're not always needed, though. You know, you'll go to the surgeon will say, you know, you've got a disc bulge, go to the physio, get it strengthened up, because it, it'll naturally get better, unless it's one of those ones which has shifted, pain below the knee, lancinating pain, always sort of problems going down the leg. They've had it for three months, it's not getting better with physio, then they go for surgery. So not everyone will go for surgery because surgery is not always the answer. Yep. Okay. Um, remember, surgery is only for people with conservative treatment fails. Okay. So it's the last resort. Um, there's all sorts of different things that go on these days. Uh, they start injecting discs. They are uh, take little bits of discs, a bit of the inside out, they cut away bits of discs, they replace one of your patients, your, her, pa her client is getting a disc replacement on Tuesday, um, where they're actually putting in a fake plastic disc, yep, into that area, taking out the old one, putting a fake one in. You imagine she probably can't do as many things as she probably wants to after that, um, but at least she gets rid of her pain as she starts functioning. And I, I said to her, that's going to take a year to get that multivitis firing getting it back to normal. They'll feel okay because they compensate, but they're not right. Um, Cortoquina. Cortoquina is bladder and bowel dysfunction. Okay, if you have a massive disc, perhaps you're in bed, you start weighing yourself and you can't stop it or you can't go to the toilet, you've got compression to your spinal cord. If that keeps going, you'll be paralyzed. So they go in for the surgery straight away. If you ever come across that, disc bulge, you know, oh, I hurt my back, and the next day, how are you feeling? Oh, I, I can't stop urinating. Whoop! Off to, the, off to the hospital. Um, so, most common things, there's, there's all sorts of stuff. They do nerve blocks, they'll do all sorts of things. Interesting stat, when they compare people who've had surgery versus uh, no surgery, 
same disc bulge as whole population. The surgery people, this is, you know, this is bad disc bulges, big, nasty, bad disc bulges. The surgery people at four years are way better than the people who haven't had surgery. At 10 years, both groups are exactly the same. Yeah? So the surgery part is just getting them out of pain quicker. My job is to get them out of pain more quickly, get them back functioning so they don't have to go through 10 years of feeling shit. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that it does resolve. The body eats away at the disc bulge and starts improving it, but do you want to go through that period of time? Probably not. Okay, what are you going to do? Send them off to physio, number one. Why? Obviously, we can diagnose it with our movement testing. We don't really need MRIs, that sort of thing, because it's a very classic scenario with these disc bulges. Um, when they go for an MRI, it's to try and determine or reassure the patient that Yes, you must do your exercises, and this is how long it's going to take, because a lot of people think it's a back strain. Um, the other thing, if it's a really bad disc bulge, they'll see how big it is to see whether the surgeon needs to go and operate on it. Um, but it, it's about, you know, if you've got a client who's got a disc bulge or symptoms like that, get them to the physio and the physio reassuring them that they need to be doing, you know, we'll get them doing exercises day one. So they need to be doing those exercises and training. They can't just stop training. They've got to stop a lot of things in your training regime, but you've got to modify it. You've got to speak to the physio and say, what can I do this week? Keep this person on board, because the worst thing they can do is go and do no exercise and get weaker. Okay, they do rest to a certain extent from certain things. They don't go lifting up shopping bags, and they get educated on what they can and can't do for the next three or four days to just to get them functioning. But you need to be getting them on board, and you, you, you need to understand that you've got to take on those physio exercises in their training session, keep them motivated, keep them going, reassure them, talk to the physio, keep them on board, because it's a very very alarming thing for people, and they feel like they're you know, in a lot of trouble, which they are, um, but they need you and me to make sure that they keep going. Um, and you, know, you need to know about management. You, if you haven't seen a disc bulge before, you know, go to the physio, ask what time frames, what can I do, okay, let's map this out over the next six months, what's going to happen, you know, when should I be reviewing them, when can I start doing you know, my squats? When can I start getting them running? All these sort of things, okay, where the physio should be able to give you a time frame and update you every week about what's happening to keep you on track and make sure that you're doing the right things every step of the way. Um, and also you know, give you things to do that you need to be giving these clients long-term. They're in this, in this handout today, but long-term, if you can get these clients doing the right things, then you're going to succeed a lot better than someone else. Okay, so what do I do? We work on a centralization theory, um, which is a McKenzie principle. I'm a McKenzie physiotherapist, but we only use that as a little part of our treatment. All right? But it's, it's the basis of trying to reduce that disc bulge. So pain, we need to actually get to the center. If you've got pain drifting off to the side, postulateral disc bulge, okay, or pain going down the leg, the more that pain migrates into the middle, the better that bulge is getting and the less irritation you're getting. Yep. And so we do specific exercises to, to try and get to that point. And we're doing repeated movements. So they don't just do a stretch, you know, get on the floor and, you know, doing this sort of thing, your McKenzie extension. Okay, when they first get there, they'll probably get to here, and that's as far as they can go. And they'll be doing up, down, up, down. And you may find they have to do, like, three sets of ten every hour for the first week just to get them out of pain. Yep, and improve that disc bulge. So it's not a loaded thing, it's a, it's a, it's a, mo a repeater moon pattern. They'll be doing rotation to try and improve the actual fluid mechanism in the disc. Side glides. So if they're like this, the, the golden rule, I can't really extend those people because the bulge is so far that way. I've got to get them this way to migrate fluid inside that disc over this way to relieve that wall pressure. Yeah? And get them sort of over this way so they can sort of straighten up. Once they're straight, then we can start extending them and migrating fluid that way to get it a little bit more even. And then they'll find, hey, I can actually bend better. My mechanism's working a little bit better, yeah. How do you go with um, trying to figure out if it's the bulge that's causing the problem on the side of the bulge is, or perhaps if it's a facet joint or an osteostruct on the other side? Well, you're never going to know, yeah. okay? And the th this is the funny and the grey area about this. You've got to go by the symptoms and you've got to pretend, okay, this is a disc and pretend how a disc works to get the result. Okay? And, and if what your movement pattern works, then you keep working on that movement pattern and get them better and you just nudge and tweak it. So every time they come in physio, we're nudging and tweaking and working out which is the right thing. Because you'll send someone for a scan 
and sometimes it shows hardly anything. Or they've got pain at a level where there's no bulge, and you're going, well, how does that work? You know? Or they've got a big roaring facet joint, but they're showing disbulge symptoms. You know, so with this sort of thing, um, disbulge is a very classic. Your facet joint will be different. They'll usually be able to bend forward quite well, and their bending backwards is pretty atrocious. But when you load them up, you know, then you find there's, a, there's a, a facet joint issue. And a lot of the time, facet joints are sore and standing, not sitting. Whereas these people will be sore and sitting. You know, they'll say, when is the pain the worst? When I sit down, when I bend forward. Facet joints, people are like, yeah, I run. When I get to about 30 minutes, I start getting really sore in my back. And that might be actually an extensor overload issue. Um, but yeah, it's funny. You don't sort of, in our practice, when you, when you get down the nitty gritty and you really work out what's the facet joint issue, and they go to the end of the stage, and you know, one out of a 50 would have the facet joint issue, and the rest are disc problems. Yeah. Because it's the disc problem that's the degenerative structure. Unless they're like a cricket or something like that who's you know, doing this sort of movement, that may be a facet joint issue. So soft tissue release, dry kneading, trying to get these extensor muscles switching off, trying to get the spasm switched off, get them functioning, that sort of thing. And then we move them into rehab. So your rehab part, why are we doing it? Your primary goal, as you've probably heard many times, is the restoration of function, okay? We've got to just get these people moving and out of pain. That's our goal. To do that, you've got to avoid aggravating factors. If they sit down a lot, they've got to stand up. I've got a lawyer at the moment who's got a massive disc bulge. He's really good now, but he had to stop sitting. He said, I can't have in mediations all day. We'll stand up. And he physically had to just stand up a lot of the time and just couldn't sit down. When he did sit down, you know, lumber roll in the chair. Thought it was match. Thought I was. I thought I was Jesus when I gave him one of these things. Because it stopped him going to flexion. Because he's so used to going to flexion, and he didn't. He had so much pain he couldn't hold himself up. So if I got in there, I pushed himself up and did a little bit of neutral. And he goes, "Oh, that's awesome." Because he's not going to flexion. He's getting back to the neutral. And he goes, and he can rest the muscles, it rests the muscles, and they go, oh, that's so good. But again, over a period of time, that's right, got to stand up again. And he feels a lot better in standing. Um, so avoiding that thing, you know, if they're gardening, well, hey, let the garden grow for a little bit. Okay? If you're deadlifting, get rid of it. Okay? You've got to do all these sort of things that avoid the principle of flexion and sitting yep, for a period of time. Bad habits, you know, can't sit down on the couch like this anymore. Yeah. They've got to sit well, and they've got to get on the floor, and they've got to do things over a period of time to get them back to restoring their function. Because if they keep aggravating it, it just goes on and on and on and on. The more they aggravate it, the more that shuts down. It's like running on a sprained ankle all the time. You know, keep running on it, keep irritating it, keep irritating it, keep irritating it. It's never really going to get better. Um, your training program has to change. It doesn't stop, it changes. And as long as you change in the correct way, which you'll learn a little bit today, what to do and what not to do, you'll succeed well with these people. Um, axial loading. So surgeons will say, get rid of axial loading, which means weight on the spine. So the first thing you do is you get rid of everything weighted. Yep, no more squats. For a period of time, but we teach them how to squat again correctly with their breathing, and then we slowly build them up. Because eventually getting them back to doing a little bit of weight, like a 20 kilo bar on them, will actually improve their strength of their spine, which will help them. But if they go beyond their body weight, which is the golden rule, so they say, if I'm 80 kilos and they go, I go beyond 80 kilos, I'll disc bulge, I'm probably going to increase my disc pressure too much again and cause another problem. So your aim now is, you know, if this person was doing, you know, 220, you know, he's a big bodybuilder, he's doing 220 on the squats or something like that, then you're going to say, mate, you're 80 kilos, 80 kilos is your limit now. And that might be quite devastating for him, but he will never get back past 80 anyway, most of the time. If he does, he's going to cause another problem. Um, so you're placing the unloaded movement. We're doing movement patterns unloaded. Um, and your biggest thing here, maintenance of the movement low leg with exercise. So you've got to main, make sure they keep doing the right exercises, keep doing the boring low level stuff, even if it's a warm up, to keep things firing. Because the degeneration in that disc will keep wanting to make that core shut down all the time. It's a bit of a pain in the ass. So inner core versus outer core. Okay? They don't just do their little exercises for a bit for the physio and then go do just planks and crunches and you know, twisting stuff. They've got to keep doing their low-level stuff. 
these people. Fit people, don't worry. These people, got to keep doing their low-level stuff somewhere in their program, even if it's just once a week. Okay. Okay, stretches. Let's get you up on here. Um, extension lying, so this one here. Just going to run through a few things. That, you're right. Going to run through a few things with you just to make sure that when you're doing, you understand what I want you to do. Um, yep. <laughs> you don't have to stand up. Just have a line in front. Okay, extension and line. A little bit different to cobra and yoga. A little bit different. These people, what you want to do is you want to try and keep the pelvis on the ground. Okay. When they push up, they try not to use their lower back. So you've got to try and make sure that this is soft in here and you just get their hands and say, switch that off, switch your buttocks off, let it go. Because you're just trying for movement and down again. Is Up. The well, the what? No, no. And she's got a disc problem, so I'm not going to let her do that. <laughs> if she falls, I might be liable. <laughs> How many? It, Michelle is very fit personal trainer, gym manager. She's got a disbulge. She had two disbulges, just came out of the blue. How many years? Six. Six now. She's still got poor extension. I'm seeing her on Monday to fix this, but she's still got poor extension. So she's still tightening up because she's got degeneration in her lumbar spine. She has to work very hard on this to get this better. And I've had cortisone. And she's had cortisone, and surgery, and all sorts of stuff, and she's still got an issue with this going on because she hasn't done enough of the right conservative work on it. Yep. So you'd go up, set a 10, drop down, rest, maybe do another exercise, do it again, okay? Do it again until they feel a little bit looser. Going up to the pain only, not through the pain. Yes. Yep, they can do all that sort of stuff as well if, they, if you've got people switching on and knowing what they're doing, okay? A lot of people don't. If they're in a lot of pain, they just have no idea. And they're not to say any movement's good movement. This, if they can just get some of this going, they'll feel, probably feel a hell of a lot better once they stand up. They go, God, I feel better. I can sit better now. Yes. Doesn't matter with this one because that's the curve going that way. I mean, I've got a bit of scoliosis. So you've got to manage it. Remember, scoliosis, if they've got tie muscles on one side, stretch them out, massage them out. If they're weak, they're going to be usually weak on that side as well. Keep them doing side planks, that sort of thing. Yep. Okay, job. Get your hands on. Yep. Get your hands on. I want you to. You, yeah, and if, and if they're not switching off, give them to clench them and then relax them and learn how to relax the muscle. And eventually, over time, they'll start switching off. Yep, yep. Just with the stretch, yep. Okay? So that's your extension. Extension standing, have a stand up, is harder because it's loading. You know, you've got loading going on. It's like people go, oh, God, I can't do that, though. And this is our test when we go, are we getting them improving when they go, yes, I can actually do that now, that's awesome, and look at me, I'm actually going forward a little bit better. Okay? We might just test this. I'll give you a little test if we've got enough time. She's got poor extension. Does that hurt? Yeah. Okay. So if you just go back to tell me, show me where it hurts. About there. And go forward. How far forward? No problems there, is there? Okay, no issues there. But extension is poor. All right? Now, what I'm going to get her doing is unloaded, three sets of ten, then we'll test that again. Okay? Do you want to do that? So while I'm talking, she can do three sets of ten. Sometimes you have to overpress them. But extension and standing is for people you can't get on the floor. Okay? Truck drivers and that sort of stuff, they've got to start doing this sort of thing. I know it'll hurt a little bit, but they've got to start doing something to get their extension better. And over time, they'll be doing this quite a bit to improve their extension movement. Our rotation line will come to a minute. Side glides is the manual stuff. Leave that to the physio, don't bother with that. Um, because, and the same with this nerve flossing thing, if they've got pain going down their leg and they've got tethering and stuff, leave that to the physio. It's more of a technical thing, but it's just in there to show that what's happening. Um, so going right up to the pain, Michelle, that's it. Now, when they get to the point where they're getting a bit looser, they need to breathe out at the top of the movement, so they need to pause, lock their hands, breathe out, let their tummy button sag to the floor, get a stretch, drop down again. Okay, every time you extend, you're improving that disc pressure, yes. Sorry, how long you hold back a couple of seconds. Yeah. Don't hold for too long. It might not be a disc problem then. You might have something else going on. So that's stuff you need to get checked out. If that's not working for you, it's probably something else. Yep. You're probably more like me where I have a facet joint. 
so you might have a bit of both. Okay, so you've got natural degeneration, but you might have a facet joint issue, especially if you stand up a lot. Okay? All right, Michelle, have a jump up again. Yep. Oh, I'm cured. <laughs> Get out of here. Right, hers is going to take a very long period of time, okay, because she's had it for a very long period of time. Rotation and lying, that's when you're going to be doing this one. Football stretch, pretty easy. I want you doing that sustained. Okay, do you want me to do that again for you? David Beckham stretch, yeah? Pretty easy. Sustained for a minute. Okay, not repeated, sustained for a minute, but then repeated three times. Yeah, you need to make sure you're you're in line. Correct. Yep. I mean. Yeah. I mean, these sort of people, you've just got to get them doing some sort of movement to them to rotation stuff, then refine it as they get, you know, if they don't, I don't feel the stretch anymore, then you go, okay, get your hips in line, let's do it a little bit more. Okay, but you may find if you start doing that straight away, it's like, oh, I can't really do that. you just got to get some sort of movement pattern happening into rotation. It improves the hydration, mecha hydration mechanism in that disc. Now, I would be working towards the painful side. So if someone's got pain on the left side, you move their leg to the left to try and think about shutting down the left side of the disc. It's hard to sort of imagine, but you'll be a lot better progress with that than going the other way. Once it's sort of more centralised, then you can go both ways. QL extensors, glutes, hamstrings, hip flexors, all the great things to try and improve the flexibility around the pelvis. Sometimes they can't get into those positions because they're so sore. They just have to stick to the lower back for a moment and then they move to try and lose some of their, their muscles. If you can lose some muscles, great. Be careful you're not loosening out muscles that are already long. Okay? If they're in an anterior tilt like this, probably no point stretching out their hamstring because they're already lengthened. Yep. But very good idea to do hip flexors to get them into that position. Long term, you've got to be thinking about once I get this back problem issues, I need to work a hell of a lot on their hamstrings to get strength to hold them in that position because a lot of the time the TA can't do that full pelvic tilt all the time. You need a big three hamstrings holding and pulling down at the back to keep them in neutral. Okay, big muscles to hold them, not core stability muscles to try and hold them in neutral. Remember, those muscles are designed to, to switch on in neutral and stabilise, not to try and haul up that pelvis if it's down so low. Yep, you've got to think outer core, outer core hamstrings with that. Let's have a look at this QL stuff. I'd love you guys to test this one out on yourself today. But this one, when you see people doing this, they're usually stretching their hamstrings, right? They go out there and stretch their hamstrings. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fine for a hamstring stretch. Awesome. But what you need to be working on is getting these extensor spasm reduced and getting extensors looser. So if you can bring that knee up to their armpit, and they get forward enough, they may find, oh, there's my stretch there already. If they don't feel anything, then they slide that leg forward and they keep with that knee. Don't get away from that. And then you'll start really feeling your curl extensors start releasing because it's locked down with the pelvis and then you're moving forward. Once you get to that point, you go, oh, yeah, that's a really good stretch. Hand on the knee and then rotate 90 degrees away and you'll feel that really kick in and then come over. It's a lot different than doing that. And you've really got to test it out yourself and get that movement. The biggest take-home message with that stretch is trying to get your chest onto your knee. Okay? And stick with it. Test it out on yourself. It'll, you'll really feel that. you go, oh my God, I'm stretching something I haven't stretched before. Yep. And it's your lower back. Be careful though, because that is what? Flexion. Yep. So it's a stretch that's down the track a little bit. Once they get their flexion better, then they start working on getting this reduced. Otherwise, they may find they do that stretch and they go, oh shit, you know, I can't, now I can't bend backwards because they've gone into flexion. The very acute people. Yep, test it out yourself today. It's awesome. All right, here we go. We've got four things on this. I'm going to get Michelle up on this one. 
You're breathing, we're going to go through straight out. Remember, like I said at the start, your breathing is about people in pain. This is about people in pain, disc prolapses, core shutdown. This is how to get things back on track. It's a lot different than doing brace work, kettlebell work, you know, this sort of stuff. That's, we're not dealing with that today. All right. Now, with this, people, you guys can test this out yourselves. Put your pens and papers down. You might have to write some things down later, but... I want you to do what she's doing, but you can do it in sitting. Okay. Neutral and breathing. First thing you do, find your neutral. So you arch your lower back. Curl it under. Arch it again. Curl it under. Find that midway point between... So you're rotating your pelvis up and down. Okay, where's that midway point between the two to find your neutral? All right. Two fingers. I want you to go under your T-shirt, under your trousers there. Find the two bony points at the front of your pelvis, your ASIS. Go down an inch and in an inch. Don't go down too far. Down an inch and in an inch, all right? And the soft stuff, all right? Best way to feel what your transversus is doing. What you're feeling is your obliques, because that's what's on top. But you're feeling if the transversus is doing something underneath when you do this. So when she's here, and I'm feeling what's going on here, I want to know what those muscles are doing. With your clients, they probably don't have any idea what's happening with the muscles. So if you cough, cough, <laughs> bounces out, okay, that's a bounce out effect, an oblique effect, all right? Say so we don't want that big push out like that, okay? We don't want that sort of big, all right? So, okay, I've got that idea. First thing they do is try and get their breathing right. People in pain, we just forget about their TA at the moment. We're just concentrating on getting their breathing correctly because most of the time they're breathing incorrectly. They're using the wrong, doing the wrong thing. So you've got to train them that they cannot raise their ribs when they breathe in. They can't <gasps> do that sort of thing. Because if they raise their lower ribs here, they're destabilizing that nice cylindrical vacuum you've got going on in there. So first thing they do, when they breathe in, they've got to breathe in and expand their lower ribs. So your lower ribs, for, you, for, for her, is going up. For you guys, your lower ribs are doing that, okay? Not lifting up. So they're expanding here when you breathe in through your nose because your diaphragm will come down suck air in and expand the ribs, all right? If you keep your ribs down but expanding, then you'll more likely maintain a good um, position in your in transversus, but we're still not worrying about it at the moment. The biggest thing is on the breath out. So they breathe in through here. When they breathe out, you're feeling what's going on here. When you breathe out, I want you to lift your pelvic floor slowly. Now, for people who don't know what their pelvic floor is, females most likely will know what their pelvic floor is because males, we don't have as, as good a pelvic floor because we've only got one thing to do, they've got two things to do. So with males, what I want you guys to do is hold a pee and hold a fart at the same time. <laughs> Sounds stupid, doesn't it? Check it out, hold a pee, hold a fart, okay, yeah. That's your pelvic floor, okay? And if it feels a bit weak and a bit, oh, what, am I, what am I doing? Well, you have not got a good pelvic floor, okay? So if, if, if you take I mean, anything today, holding a pee is the right movement and it's on the breath out and it needs to be graded so you gently think about your pelvic floor is like a hammock and it just gets lifted up internally females have got a little bit more knowledge because they can do an internal draw up which you got girls going yes i know what you're talking about i have no idea okay <laughs> so they will do an internal draw up as well but also holding a pee also works for them as well and whatever cue works for your clients the best use that cue because it'll switch on that pelvic floor when you do that do you feel that transversus muscle kicking in so I want you to take a breath in, breath out, and draw up that pelvic floor. You should feel that tighten under your tummy, okay? So your pelvic floor activates your transversus. Does that make sense? Yep. If you're not feeling anything, you guys probably got a pretty weak pelvic floor, all right? So that's the first part. You've got to get that going. They've got to bring it up just to what we call a 30% threshold, all right? So if you bring it up like that, it's going to bounce out, it's going to be 100%. Okay? It doesn't operate at that. And your breathing and that sort of stuff doesn't operate at that when you're in pain. When you have to do a kettlebell, it's going to have to be up 100%. Okay? But at the moment, what I want you doing is just bringing up the 30. And think of a volume knob. You know, visualize, okay, 30. Or, or revs, so okay, 3,000 revs. You know? Just so you can feel what's going on. And a lot of the time you have to get your fingers in there going, okay, no, no, you're at 50. Okay, you know, you're at 10. And, and that's where they need to do it. Yes. Yeah, awesome. Yep, awesome. All sorts of fear. Getting your fingers on and getting them doing it because they've got to understand what they're feeling and you've got to tell them that is correct, you know, that is not correct because then they can do it at home. Yep. 
the, the cuff thing's great for people are really struggling, you know, but for you guys you haven't got one, that's the thing, you've just got to do what you can, okay? If you get that pelvic floor breathing right, that's an awesome start. And just doing that over a period of time actually relaxes your extensors in your back and starts switching things off. And you probably find they do this for a bit, they stand up and go, I actually feel a bit better now because they've reduced their spasm down. So once they've got the breathing right, then you can start getting their TA right. Now for people in sitting, your TA will be working anyway if you sit correctly. When you're not sitting correctly, it won't be. So I want you all to slouch. Get your fingers in there again. What's happening? Not much. Okay, so find your neutral. Just bum back in the chair. Get your neutral, arch your back, tummy under, that sort of thing. Then you can add to it a little bit. I want you to go tall at the back of the neck. Nice and tall, I'm the tallest person in the class. Shoulders down, put your fingers back in. Things working? Yep, okay, so it's a natural thing for that to happen. When people are in pain, that usually doesn't switch on well enough. So what they have to try and do is draw that tummy in about 30% to engage it consciously. So I want you just to pretend that it doesn't work, and I want you guys to engage and draw it in 30%. Not like, oh my god! So when you've got your fingers here, when you draw it in, it should feel like what we call a ground swelling. So if this is my, this is my fingers on my tummy, there's my obliques, my transversus is here. If, I, if you go, Rawr! It does that. My transversus goes on, my obliques go on, and everything kicks in. So I want a ground swelling. I want this muscle contracting, which just nudges that layer up a little bit. Okay, so what you're feeling is tone, not pushing out, tone. So draw that tummy in, and you feel, oh, there it is. Got it. Now hold it there, and I want you to practice your breathing. This is the hard part. So you've got this naturally 30%. When you breathe in, Ribs expand, this stays on. When you breathe out, pelvic floor comes up and you'll feel it kick in a little bit more. When you breathe in, it lets it go a bit, but this stays at 30. Okay? These people need to be educated how to keep that muscle on because it's not happening automatically. So they need to train it. Okay? It's a very, very hard thing to do. And they go, oh my God, that's so hard. You know? But they do it over a period of time. They start kicking in. Everything starts working. And they feel a lot better because all these muscles start switching on and holding the spine automatically. Yep. Okay. So that's your neutral core and your breathing. Very good thing to try and start doing with your clients and get them doing in a squat, which we'll come to in a minute. If you have a sit for me, Michelle. She's probably been sitting down for too long. Um, now, with your multivitus, this is a little bit harder. Fingers here. Meet your two fingers together. Find a bony point, bony point in your lower back. Your spinous process. Come either side of it. Dig in. Now, a lot of you have not got great core multivitus and too much extensors will probably not get this too right. It'll be a bit confusing. But what I want you to try and do is get that core set right. So you've got to be really bolt up right. Get your core set right. Get your TA on. Get your breathing right. Once you've got that, what I want you to think about is your tailbone floating up to the back of your head. Now, don't go and bang, move it, because you'll just, move, you'll just switch on your senses. Again, I want to feel a ground swing. So you have to really dive your fingers into your lower back to feel that deep multivitus pushing back those muscles back out against you. And when you gently float, and we're talking about, think about floating up about half a centimetre. And you should feel that muscle just oof, kick in a little bit, just a little bit of tone. Okay? A lot of the time people go, yep, I got it, awesome. Other people go, I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay? Those people who have no idea what they're talking about need some training with that. Okay? If they, and so you, what you've got to make sure of is these people are not going and using extensors. Again, this stuff is, a lot of it is in the physio room. It's boring, it's hard, we need to spend half an hour on this. And clients coming to you for exercise, I'm not coming to you for this. I'm just trying to get you to understand what we go through with these people. Um, Neutral glutes is the classic one. People sit down, stay in the same position, go back into your core position, get your TA on 30%, get your breathing right. Now I want you to push your heels down into the floor and clench your buttocks and hold that on and now breathe. So now you're telling your brain, get my glutes going, get my quads going, get everything stabilising. Okay, so all the muscles switch on and stabilise and hold Okay, on a tonic low level and then you get your breathing right. Okay. People who do this during the day usually stand up and go, I feel really good now because they switched off their spasm. They've told their brain, I can use my stabilizers. I don't have to use my big global muscles to do all the work. 
Yeah? And heel sides is where you push your heel down. If, I, if you just have a look at this one. We're beginning heel sides. We're trying to tell the brain a pattern of movement. When I push my heel down, I want my buttock to work, my core to work, not my hamstring and my extensors. So they go at this point, they push, they're pushing their heel down, clenching their buttock to try and slide their foot down. Oh, a little bit. Not, like, not so much that they can't move their heel. It's a little bit. It's trying just to engage it. You're not trying to go and bring everything on. It's a little tiny contraction because it's a stabilization contraction. Yeah, very difficult thing to do. Great for people who've got poor glute control, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They will get it after a while if you persevere with it. It will switch on. If you're generating, as like Francine and George says, if you're generating a movement pattern from the brain that is natural and you keep repeating it, it will fire up those muscles. If you go back into a compensation pattern or try too hard or, or you know, try and fake it, you'll only reinforce that pattern and not this one. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. All right. So once they've got that first two weeks out of the way, they're going to start getting into a few more difficult things. Clams, prone glutes, prone cat raises, bridges, needle slip squats. Slip squats. A lot of people don't know how to squat. They, they lose the ability to go, oh, you, know, you know, they don't know how to get out and get up. Okay, so if you think of Ricky Ponting in the slips, okay, that's the position they need to get into. All right? And a slip squat is hands on the legs and then teach them they've got to bend at that point. Very good for any of your clients who don't squat well as well. You know, they sort of, you know, sort of, you know, they don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, is that right? So they need to be here, tall, core, all the things you've been practicing for two weeks. So they know what to do when they breathe in and just run their hands down the legs to meet the knees. And then run their hands back up again. They're probably going to do a pretty good movement pattern in their lumbopelvic region. Okay? When they run their hands down the knees, they're not going to do this sort of thing. Because you've got to teach just run your hands down your knees. And they naturally should bend. You've got to move them though as well. Again, think about that. Don't go into too much extension. All right? Keep it flat. Keep it neutral. Don't go into flexion. All right? They may only go down to the point where they go, ooh, come back up again. Down they go, ooh. And this is the thing, they've got to be practicing this. They can't just rest and oh, wait for a bit and you know, it'll be better next week. They've got to practice it. The more they practice, the better they're going to get. The more they switch on those muscles, the more alive they're going to get. Because remember, a lot of people with disc bulges don't have pain. It's a lot of the time the, the, the pain is from muscle shutdown and dysfunction and things not working and spasm. Yep. Prone cat raises, this one here. Yep. What you've got to do with these people, they've got to maintain their core. So they can't go into extension and do this because they lose their core. They've got to get their neutral right. Find out where their neutral is, maintain that, and then slowly not shift and get their breathing right and get that movement pattern. When they get their leg up, they start losing their core like that, they've got to stop and then come back again. But teaching them to move opposite limbs like this, like walking, okay, by maintaining that neutral core to stop spasm and extensive dominance and encourage inner core work to stabilize. If you do things too quickly, do too much load, do them too quickly, they'll just revert back to their old pattern of what they were doing before. Um, prone glutes, this is a very good one. Um, very difficult though, so I might just, how's the time going? I might just skip over that one a little bit because it is a very uh, physio orientated thing. It's this one here. Okay. They are trying to push their hand down and gently lighten their leg to activate their glute. It's a very difficult thing to do. That's why it's in the two to four week mark. Okay? If any of you guys want to, me to go through that, it's more of a one-on-one -on -one thing, come and see me after. Okay, so by, this is a rough guide. Everyone's a little bit different, but by four to six weeks, they should have done four to six weeks of really good core work. You know, really good. They know what their TA is. They know what their pelvic is. They know what 30% is. They know what their breathing is. They know how to slip squat. They've got their glutes semi-firing. Things are working for them. Their pain is down. They can start doing outer core stuff. Yep. So, leg this. This is the glute med stuff. If they're sitting down, you guys are just raising one leg. They can do that at work. Very difficult thing to do. 
standing, trying to get this position here and trying to raise one leg up without dropping down. Bosu hover holes. I haven't got a Bosu here, but pretend this is a Bosu. If I'm on a Bosu, okay, now I'm like this. What I want to be able to do is not go, yay, and use my extensors. I want to be able to try and get my pelvis posterior tilted back to neutral, because usually it goes into extension because I'm trying to hold myself up. Posterior tilt to here, get my scapula and shoulder stabilizer switched on, get myself into a neutral position and keep my glutes on, keep my hamstrings on, keep myself in neutral, keep my TA going, keep my breathing going and hold it there and try to breathe and get my breathing right. So I'm trying to teach my brain to, yes, I can switch on my extensors, but underneath that, I want my volatilis going, I want my pelvic floor going, I want my TA going, I want everything working together. I don't want to overload. So it's teaching these people, when the load starts going on, don't go back to your dominating pattern again. Trunk twists, you've got to get these people twisting. Low load, okay? Breathing, that sort of thing. All right? Body weight squats, they've got to learn how to squat again. So, you know, because if they're going to pick up the washing, they've got to learn how to do it properly. They can't pivot forward like that. All right? So, again, keep them squatting. Do you want to jump up for me? All right. Here she is. So, find her neutral. She really doesn't, she's still not too sure where her neutral is. About there, that's not bad. Is her TA going? Yes, it is. All right. Now, when she squats, remember, this is a squat pattern for people who are in pain, trying to re-educate what's going on. She's got to initiate it from the lumbopelvic region. Now, if you just hold it there, I know this is going to be a bit hard. Then you get here, this has got to be the flat part. So you can't have that massive curve. You can't have a round. It's got to be a very slight curve here. Okay, there's your neutral. Just come up again. Now, when she does as well, her knees have got to go forward, her bum's got to go backwards. If they're having trouble, the squat is a sit down, right? Say, so sit down on that seat. Stop. Stand up again. Now, when they stand up, a lot of the time they go into a extension to get themselves up. So, let's get them back to neutral. They sit down slowly, bend your knees, come forward, body weight, center of gravity stays shoulders so the ankles. When they get to that point, when they come up, you guide them and make sure they stay in that neutral and then they use their glutes at the top there and don't extend too much. Okay? And again, simple rules. My back needs to be the same angle as my shin. So if she comes down again, what happens is I can't have her like that because her shins are not the same as her back. So I've got to get her back in the right position, okay, making sure she doesn't arch too much. And if she runs out of ankle room because you've got tight ankles, that's as far as she's about to go. Okay, and then coming back up again. All right, same thing. You don't want them throwing their knees forward and trying to do this sort of thing. Okay, they've got to just, everything has got to bend at the same time. Yep, when they squat down, they breathe in. They breathe out before they squat up, pelvic floor comes up. So the pelvic floor has got to engage when it's against gravity or a concentric phase, or against weight, okay, on the exertional point. That's when you, the exertional point, that's when you need your pelvic floor, because you're breathing out. So you need your pelvic floor up, yep. If you try and hold your breath with these people, you'll reinforce a dominating pattern, which is so bad for them at this time. Yep. Physio lunges. I coined this physio, jump, stay up here. Coined this physio lunges simply because I had a lot of discussions with surgeons, Surgeons hate lunges for knees because they cause a lot of patellofemoral wear and tear in the back leg. All right, so your standard classic pump class lunge like that is really bad for your back knee, according to surgeons, and I believe them. Now, what you need to do, therefore, is focus on the front leg and therefore keep their shin and their back in the same angle. It's like a squat, it's on one leg, okay? When they get down to that point, their shin needs to be the same as their back, they need to have that nice sort of like, where's their curve going on in here? That's good. And they need to put about 80% of the weight into the front leg and then push backwards. Okay, so if they start 50-50, they end up with 80% on the front leg and push back. That's the idea. Okay, breathing in on the way down, breathing out on the way up. You'll find this burns buttock muscles, quads way more on one leg than doing a static lunge. You'll probably never do those normal lunges again with your clients ever again. Never. Okay? Never. never. 
All right? Because this gets so much better results with stability, strength, control on leg. I mean, we're walking all the time. We need this control. We don't sort of walk like this all the time. We go from one leg to the other. The weight goes on the front leg. Yep. And this burns you up big time and is very safe for your back. And it's teaching your back to stabilize in a nice position. Yep. Because there's no axial loading. People with disc problems, physio lunges don't start putting weight on too early. Okay, you don't want to load them up too early. You've got to just get them functioning first. All right, great exercise to do for you guys. Level four, last stage. Now, 12 weeks. Now, this means when they get to 12 weeks, they should be doing these sort of things. It doesn't mean that weeks one and two that you've forgotten all that stuff. You've got to keep doing that stuff. And these disc people who've had disc problems for four, six years, she can't just go back and do leg press and things like that and forget all this stuff. She's got to keep doing it. Deadlifts has got a question mark, okay? Meaning you've got to be very, very good at your technique to get up to that point. You do need to do lifts because of a functional movement pattern. You need to be able to pick a bag of washing off the floor. And I mean a normal deadlift. So I'm talking about bending your knees, dropping down and coming back up again, all right? Try and do it with a very light bar or no bar at all to get that pattern right, all right? Rather than both, people are usually not flexible enough for a um, sumo squat. People are usually not flexible enough to do that. No one really picks up a you know, laundry like that anyway, okay? So you're better to teach them to do that movement there, to stop them doing that movement. That's why... This hamstring deadlift, which is in our sheet over here of rehab for lower backs, people who've got a lower back like mine, not, no disc bulge problems, but a lot of extensor issues, because I've been spent my lifetime being hyperlodotic, need to do a lot of hamstring work. But I have to have my core really good before I do that. Okay, but when you've got someone who has got a disc bulge problem, you know that 220? We don't want them doing that. Okay? So get rid of it out of their program with people who've had disc prolapses. Just, there's no, no point doing it. Yep. Say, say it again. I would stick to your mod just your normal deadlift. Yep, so no, no hamstring. Hamstring means Romanian. Yep. So no Romanian deadlifts to try to hamstring simply because of your, the angles that are going on. You're better to drop down and bend your knees. Okay? Because the disc pressure is better when you keep your centre of gravity closer to you. Centre of gravity is further away when you do that. Um, front squats instead of back squats. Why front squats? Yeah, you can hold your core better with a front squat. Okay, when you're here you tend to go into extension. All right, so better to have the front squat here and you'll just maintain a better position here. All right, um, and obviously your sumo squats is the things you can do as well, but again, question mark because not many people do it that well. Not many people are flexible enough. No, not, necess not really. It's only if it's sort of out here. Okay? You're just trying, with the back one, you're trying to get them out of this extensive pattern. Most people will do, you know, if they're, a, if they're a person who's had a, a lot of core shutdown, they won't be able to do a, a squat. As soon as they do that, they'll just go straight into that extensive mechanism again. Whereas here, they're going to be, you can control them a little bit better. And the weight's got to be lighter. You know, we're talking about, a, for, for blokes, 20 kilo bar, maybe for girls, a 10 kilo bar. Because that's enough just to go, okay, yeah, I've got the weight on, I can sort of feel what's going on. The weight's too heavy, the body's going to wind up its extensors and start using its globals to take over to handle the weight. But in time, that weight increases like you normally progress, and it strengthens you up. So these things will strengthen your spine up as long as it's working first. Yep. Okay, so what are you going to watch for? Poor form, okay? If clients who've had disc problems, or even just clients who haven't got disc problems, because you know that most people get disc problems anyway, they're just asymptomatic, okay? So, as personal trainers, your role is to watch poor form, okay? Losing neutral, losing that lumbar curve when they squat, Losing that lumbar curve when they deadlift, overdoing the lumbar curve when they deadlift. You know, you see people with, when it gets real heavy and they put 100 kilos on and they're, you know, getting right up there. They might be okay now, but 
you as a trader, your job is to try and correct their form, right? Okay, and you need to be doing it, especially with these clients. Um, heavy lifting, obviously. Axial loading. Things to be watching for. Right? Things not to do with your client. Global core versus outer core. Yeah, I'm doing my core, I'm doing my core, yeah, I'm doing all this core. And all they're doing is, you know, planks and crunches and side planks and all these outer core things and extensions and you've got to start thinking, okay, well, where's your inner core work going on? Do I need to stop or slow down how much outer core work they're doing and bring in a little below stuff? If it's too boring, they're not on board, get the physio involved, get someone they may think, okay, oh, yep, I'm seeing a specialist here, yep, cool. You know, I'll get this stuff. They might get on board a little bit better, which will help you say, see, I told you you had to do this stuff, and get them doing it. And you might gear it very easy, like, okay, I want you to do this as a warm-up. You know, it might be their warm-up just to engage things, and then they start doing it. Now we'll do some planks and things. Okay, but you've got to make sure they're doing it and getting it done correctly so they are working because most people who've had disc bulges, you know, pregnancies, that sort of thing, you know that your core is not so great internally. You know you're overdoing outer core work. Um, and it's just the fact that people don't know what to do. They don't know what to feel. They don't know how to get it going because it is very difficult. And they are battling against pain mechanisms that are trying to tell your brain, switch off, you know, don't do it. Um, watch those people occupational lifestyle. So people who, you know, they come to you, they're doing deadlifts all week, they come to you and they're doing more stuff, they sit down in a truck all day, they do gardening, they're a bit of home landscaping, they sit and watch the footy, you know, these people, you think, okay, what do I need to change in this person's program? I need to maybe stop sort of loading them up into this thing. I need to start work on their inner core a little bit work. I need to get them doing extensions. I need to get their flexibility a little bit better. You know, really work out, have they got good core or not? And are they being safe? Yeah, especially if they're older. Family history, take a history. Take a medical history. A lot of time and time again, you know, we're so used to it because we get drummed into it at university. You know, we get marked strictly on our history. You know, you, people, a lot of people fail because they're not writing enough. They miss one thing out, you know, on their history. We write a massive history about these people because it's so important about what they've done in their life and what they've got determines what we're going to do with them. Same with, the, with you guys. If you miss a disc old disc problem because you didn't ask, they didn't think, oh, yeah, it's just a disc problem. Yeah, it's, it's fine now because I feel good. If you miss that, you may be you know, in jeopardy of creating another problem down the track, which you don't want. Um, and lastly, look, the look goods but no goods. Okay, a lot of these people are hyper-mobile people. They're very flexible, so they can go in any position you want. Yeah, they look good in the gym. Their form is great because they're bracing and they're doing outer core work and they're really looking good and everything's switching on. And as soon as they finish their session, they'll walk down the street and do this sort of thing. And you go, hang on a minute. What are you looking like that for? Or they, you know, they do all that, then they go sit down. Oh, that's a great session. Sit down and back at work. You know? In their core, you know, nothing's going on when you sit poorly. That hour in the gym is going to do nothing for them if they do this all the time. Okay, so watch those people. Try and re-educate them about that neutral we talked about. So you can see how it naturally switches on. Okay, if they can do that most of the time during the day, or repeat it every hour, at least you know that you're getting some things working here. So when they come to the gym, it's not all shut down. Um, yeah, look good, no good. What are you going to avoid? The big one, all right? Remember, again, these are people who've had disc problems. These are people with core shut down. These are people in significant pain, all right? Heavy lifting's out. And I mean heavy like heavy lifting is out. Bend over rows. Why? Disc pressure. Yep, get rid of it. Do something else. Romanian hamstring deadlifts, they're out. Seated rear raise, which you probably guys never do anyway. But if you see your client doing it, what are you doing? I saw you in the gym the other day, you're doing the get it, not allowed to do that. Low squatting, simply because as soon as they get past the point of break, they'll lose their curve. Everyone does. Fine for people without a disc problem, not fine for people with one or have had one. Long distance running because of just the axial loading. You know, 5, 10K is cool. Marathon, probably not so great. They're going to be one of those special people who work so hard on their core and get such good control that they're so determined to do a marathon, fine. 
Um, average Joe Bly wants to do, you know, let's do a marathon. Not so fit, not so good in that core. Old disc problem, had a couple of kids. Probably not the best thing to do. Heavy leg press. Why heavy leg press? Anyone? It's pressure straight on the spine. Yeah. And they go into flexion. Loaded flexion. 100 kilos. Boof, down. Okay, so they actually get forced into flexion. Very hard to maintain neutral on a leg press because they always go too low because the gravity and the weight is pushing down on them. So that when it gets heavy, they, oh, and then they have to push it back up again. So they naturally curve their spine. Um, flutters, <laughs> this sort of stuff. All right, sit ups, crunches, that's out. Medicine ball twists, you know, the, this one. Where they going? You know, this sort of stuff. Okay, because they're in a crunch flexion, they're up at that 200 and whatever percent it is, and they're doing twisting movements. Okay, yep. If they maintain neutral, it should be okay. Because they're relatively... Um, see, the thing about bike riding, if you're, you're sort of in a, in a neutral position going forward... What was the question? And you're doing exercise. Uh, long distance bike riding. When you're sitting, you're not doing too much exercise. Muscles aren't going ding, 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 ding. They're going like this. There's not so much support going on. So when you sit for a long period of time, eight hours is a lot bit detrimental than three hours on a bike. Yep, because you're exercising and you're moving, you're changing direction all the time and that sort of thing. Okay, so okay, but you have to build up to that. You know, it's one of those progressive things that they build up to it. Again, some people may fail at that point. They may find I can't do that anymore. Yep. All right, so long-term essentials for you guys. McKenzie extension is your goal, okay. Rotation stretches, their inner core maintenance is a big one. You've got to get these people thinking differently. Okay, they've got, yep. Yeah, cis balls okay. You'll probably find they fatigue quite quickly. They need back support. Their extensors will kick in and fire up and hold them. So you might create a bit of dominance going on. Yeah, they might, change, they might change it a little bit. They might go, oh, I want to sit on a Swiss ball for a couple of hours. They change it, they move around, they stand up. So would you recommend them to leave the lumber roll forever? Pretty much. Yeah. Some people hate lumber rolls, like me, because I'm hypermobile and I don't have a disc problem. And I hate it, because I don't like getting pushed in that position. I want to actually come sort of out of that position all the time. Um, flexion, they've got to be aware that they've got to reduce the amount of flexion. Lifting during the activities of daily living no grad, that golden rule, no graded body squats. And it is, like we talked about this, this biking, it is possible to get back to sport after a big disc prolapse or herniation. They've just got to work friggin' hard at it. Yeah? Sorry. And which do you guys want to do? Bondi. Bondi. So, what I want you to do, this sheet and my previous one yesterday is on our website. If you go, just Google Physio Fitness will come up first up and click on the Phylex link. You can download those things for there. If you want um, more information about injuries, that sort of thing coming into your inbox, sign up to our newsletter. We'll give you information about articles. And all my articles are on that site, if you click on the articles tab, all my old articles are on there about injuries and that sort of thing that you can download. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. See you next time. Any questions just come up. We might be out of time a little bit, but if you want a business card, they're up here as well. <laughs>